Okay, hello and welcome to my rant about integral types in C++. And first of all, I want to tell you, thank you for coming to my talk. There are many great talks going on during this uh, conference and you see the whole hall being full. Thank you for coming. Without further ado, let's start talking about integers, but let me introduce myself. I'm Alex Daskovsky. I have more than 60 years of experience in C++ or system engineering. I worked in many companies in different, uh, in, uh, different fields, but right now I'm working in a great, great company called Speed Data IO, where, where we are developing the next big thing in big data. And we're looking for many, many new engineers. So if you're looking for a job, come talk to me. We're developing a new CPU. Very exciting things happening there. I will be glad to tell you more about it later. And now let's start the rant. So, to int or not to int. Everyone here uses integral types during the prog uh, when he or she is programming, right? It's nothing new to anyone. But have you ever thought about what are the implications on your program when you are writing sign int or you are selecting unsigned int? What does it do to your performance? What does it do to your well formness of the program? Will it be undefined behavior if I use some other type? Do you think about these implications? I'm asking. Sometimes. So one person thinks about it, anyone else just uses something. Yes. Two people from the whole audience. Great. So you're in the correct place right now. OK, so there are many rules. Many things we need to know when we are using integral types. And we have to remember all those things, and that's why it's a rant. Using C++ sometimes, it's just horrible. But sometimes, it's just beautiful. In the case of integral types, it's a mess. Let's think about, let's look at uh, what some people think about those things. So, for example, Bjarne, unknown name, right? He's saying there are far too many integral types. There are far too uh, linear rules there, mixing them together. And it's a major bug source, which is why I'm saying stay simple as you can. Always use sign ins. Is he right? Maybe. And there's Dale, Dale, uh, Dale Weiler. He's a very known blogger that works at NVIDIA and develop games, and he is writing, the need for signed integers arithmetics is often misplaced as most integers never rep uh, represent negative values within the program itself. The indexing of our, an array, an iteration count of loops, reflection, uh, this concept as well. There should be a proper, uh, proper <laughs> propensity to use unsigned integer more often than signed integer. Yet, despite this, most coders incorrectly choose to use sign integer almost exclusively. What is the first type you think of when you need an integral type? I bet it's int, right? So it's wrong. <laughs> okay, to understand that, we will start looking at a simple example. And I'm air quoting it. Simple, we will see. But when you write the code in C++ itself, it's just a one-liner, something really simple. We have a function that does add and divide. That's it. One function uses in 64, and one function uses unsigned in 64. They're doing the same thing. They're adding up A and B, and they're dividing it by two. So what do you think? Which one will be better, faster, better assembly code? The unsigned one? The signed one. Yes? I'm working on a system that has different assembly instructions for each, so they'll be different, but just as efficient. So I, I had to say one thing. All of my benchmarks and uh, assembly code is from x86, because most of the users here use x86. There are some different architectures. I will not speak about those. And when I'm asking things, I'm asking just for x86, just for this talk. But I understand what you're saying. Yes? Uh, potentially, if uh, the input is only unsigned, it's 
think the unsigned one has the potential to be better optimized because it is allowed to ship while the first one cannot because shipping on signed type uh, can be weird if the most of it can be is on. Okay, so uh, Udi. Udi is saying that uh, on unsigned types we can shift and that will give us better performance. Nice. Very good answer. And let's look at the unsigned uh, assembly code. To understand this, you can see already that Udi was right. It's using shift. But to understand that, we need to understand some assembly. So I will teach you just a little bit assembly to understand my talk. First of all, we need to understand that all x86 machines have registers. They have 64-bit registers, they have 32-bit registers, 16-bit registers, and then two 8-bit registers for each one of the 64-bit registers. It's built like that because of historically they had to do it because they built on top of each other. But if you want to know more about it, you can uh, go find uh, Under the Hood talk by David Kell in C++ Now, 2023. It was a great talk. But we will not talk about that anymore. We just need to understand what all those registers are doing. Now, let's talk about the assembler itself. First, first line of code here, it's LEA. It's called Low Effective Address. That's the only instruction in x86 that says it loads something, but it loads nothing. So it's just a recompiler trick to do better performance addition. As you can see, it puts RDI plus RSI, which is the two parameters that the function gets, and puts them inside RAX. You can do it with even more than two registers inside the LEE instruction itself. So it's a great trick that the compiler does for you. Um, and then it does the shift right. And then it just returns. Why does the shift right, by the way? Anyone knows? Division by? Division by? Exactly. And now let's look at the sign example. Not so simple anymore. But still, it shifts. You can still shift it. The difference here, we will talk about it. So maybe some one of you are surprised to see that the signs are more complex in this type of, uh, of operations. Maybe not. But they are. Let's talk about the assembler again. We already know the assembler uh, example from the previous example. So we have the same load effective address here. It does the same thing. It adds up RDI and RSI and puts it in RCX. But now it does something different. It copies RCX to RAX. Then it shifts right logically 63 bits. That means it takes the most significant bit. Then it adds RAX and RCX together. And then it shifts arithmetically right. Interesting. So why did it happen? First of all, we started with, most of you already know that because the numbers are divided by two, the compiler can understand that it's something like a shift right, and then it can just replace it. But why does the compiler prefer shift right and not division? Sorry? There was a question? No. OK. Uh, and this is the answer. Each instruction that fetches from the memory is pushed into a pipeline. This pipeline has an execution inside it. The execution may be piped as well. Each execution has its own unit. So you need many of these units if you want to operate more than one operation at once. And there are some operations that are more costly than others. This cost is called latency. What is latency? Latency is the number of cycles it takes to compute an, an instruction. Errors and misalignments may cause the latency to be worse than it was before. Surprisingly, nuns and infinities are not increasing the cycles. For example, we can start looking at the most basic one of the operation. It's called add. Add is one cycle inside the pipe. IMUL is an operation that multiplies integral types. It takes three cycles in x86. 
div takes up to 20 times more than the IMU instruction, and it depends on your architecture. So you, if you will use divide, you are paying with performance. That's why the compiler wants you, wants you to help you, and if it can, it will replace it with a shift. I just want to explain what I talked about before. So here we have an execution pipeline inside a processor. Each instruction is fetched from the memory, it's decoded, it's executed, as you can see, and it's written back to the memory itself. If everything is go goes well, then you have a, a, a bandwidth of one instruction per cycle. But as I already mentioned, we don't have, we have some instructions that are pipe and they can stall. So here's an example of a stall instru uh, instruction. For example, you have here move to the memory. Move to the memory takes more than one cycle. And then you have other instructions that are waiting inside the queue and they are actually stalled until that instruction is finished. But the good thing is your processor is smart enough to do something that's called out of order execution. And when it does out of order execution, it's basically saying, if I don't have a read after write hazard, I will just replace the order of the instructions and I will do it in a different order, the way that I will still try to get the best bandwidth I can. So that's latency, and those are the processors. They're actually quite amazing, right? Nothing to be scared of, they're just trying to help you. Let's go back to our example here. What happens here? To understand that, we need to understand what is the difference between signed representation and unsigned representation of integers. So as you know, unsigned, unsigned integers are, stalled, are stored with modulo two representation. They support only positive numbers. Overflow is well defined and it's very important. The range of 64 bit unsigned integer is zero to this large number. I will not quote it. And that's how it's represented inside the memory. So you have the bits. Each bit has its own weight. So the weight is something that is the placement of the bit inside the most significant or the less significant bit. Here you have an example of five bits that we are using here. Each one of them has a weight from zero to four, and each weight has to be, um, has to be used with two in the power of the weight. So if we will add everything up, the bit multiplied by the two power of the weight, we will get the number itself. And this is the representation of 22 inside your memory. Now, overflow. That's the most important part about unsigned integers. Overflow is defined. As I mentioned, unsigned integers use modulo two representation. Modulo two representation is like looking at, at a clock. So if you add something inside a clock, if it's uh, 12 o'clock or if it's 11 o'clock, and if, if you add two to it, it will be one o'clock, right? Same thing works here with a uh, modulo with modulo two and unsigned integers. And here I have a four bit example. The maximum number we can use is 15. If we will add two to it, we will get one. It's overflow, but it's defined and the number is correct. The program is well defined. Now signed integers are different. They support negative numbers, something that unsigned do not support. They're stored using Compiler defined behavior, signed and magnitude, one complete, uh, one complement or two complement. Overflow is considered to be uns uh, undefined behavior. That's a big thing with the uh, signed integers. The range of 64 bit signed integer is of course from minus a large number to a very large number, but you can represent less positive numbers because you need one bit for magnitude or a one's complement or two complement. So who remember what one complement is? One person. Let me take you back to university. To represent a negative number with one complement, you had to invert all the bits. Pretty easy. So in this example, for, uh, if we will look at number four, 
If it's an assigned value, it's four. But basically, if it's one's complement and it's assigned value, it will represent minus three. And there's a problem with it. You can represent less uh, negative values. Because if you look at seven, seven represents minus zero. What's minus zero? That's nothing, that's just waste. Two's complement, who remembers two complement? Except that guy. <laughs> Everyone remembers that. Okay, two's complement is what most compilers use now, and we will get to that, but they used to do it in three different ways, as I mentioned. So for do, to do uh, two's complement, we are doing one's complement, and then we are adding another one to the number, and in this way, we get all the numbers. We get more representation for negative numbers, something that we didn't have with unsigned integers. And as you can see here, four in unsigned is minus four in the uh, two's complement, and uh, seven, what was minus zero before, it's minus one now, and it's something that we can use. So positive numbers and negative uh, and are represented the same way in unsigned and signed integers. That's a good thing. And since C++ 20, negative numbers have to be represented by two's complement. Thank you. Finally, it's inside the standard and it's not compiler defined. Let's go back to the example. So what happened here? I already mentioned that it still shifts, but it's doing a different kind of shift. It's not doing shift right, it's doing shift arithmetic right. Let's try to understand what's the difference between shift right and shift arithmetic right. They are different. So shift right, it's called logical right shift. It means we're shifting all the bits right and the MSB bit becomes zero. That means if we will shift this number and we had one at the MSB, it will become zero in the next number, as you can see here in the example. Shift arithmetic right, it means that we are shifting the bits right, but the MSB is, remains the same as it was in the original number. So we're keeping the sinus here, and that's why we can use it with sign. But again, why did it have to do the shift right, to take the, less, the most significant bit out of the number and then add it to the number and only then shift arithmetically right. Someone knows the answer? Well, the answer is not that simple and you have to understand your assembler. Shift arithmetic right has a different rounding mode. It rounds to zero, it rounds to the nearest and not round to zero like shift, uh, shift logical right. So to do that, to get the same rounding mode, before we can shift arithmetic right, we have to take the number, we have to take the sinus bit, we have to add it to the number itself, and only then we can shift arithmetically right. So the compiler was smart enough to give you the answer, to still give you shifts instead of division, and you will get better latency and better performance, but it had to do some sacrifice for it and as you can see, even the most simple thing with an in integral types is not that simple. If you look at the performance of those two programs, they're pretty similar because there are not a lot of uh, lines of code here and things that we need to understand. But still, you can see that signed version is slower. Now that we understand signed and unsigned a little bit more, we can, uh, we can talk about all the wonderful, wonderful pitfalls that we have in the language when we're using those numbers. This part will be a little bit more interactive, so please talk with me. We have this function here that does addition of uint8. It receives two uint8, a and b. It has an auto return type and it returns a plus b. What will be the outcome of this function if we will call it with 255 and one. Well, I heard zeros, I heard promotions, I heard many things, but let's look at what, how the compiler sees it. And you have a surprise here. 
you have integer promotion. Because those types are smaller than an int, the compiler will promote them to 32-bit integer, signed integer, and only then it will add them. And because we are using auto, it will return an int because it promoted on those two int. And surprise, surprise, you get 256. Not, a, not what you expected, right? You expected it to be zero, some of you. Here we have another example. So here, it's almost the same function, but we are not using auto. We are using uint8. What will happen here? Error? Error? Why? Zero. 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 Right. And why will it be zero? What, what does it do, actually do? Yes. Not downcasting, it's narrowing. It's called narrowing the integer. So if we look at the same thing that we did before, we will look at what the compiler sees. So the compiler will promote the types to int because they are smaller than the int itself. And then it will narrow it down to your int 8 because you ask it to do it. So be careful with those things. You need to understand what auto means, how to use it. And we will get zero, exactly what we expected it to be. There are more surprises. So let's look at this function. It has an auto return type, it's called my add, and it uses x and y, and it just returns x plus y, just in addition. What will happen now if we will send u in 64 1 and in 64 minus 2? What will be the result? What? And the result will be another surprise. We have integer promotion again. The integer promotion is when you have something that is larger than int and you have signed and unsigned types, the, uns the, uns uh, sorry, the signed type will be promoted to unsigned. So if you got unsigned long geeks and long geeks, the long geeks will be promoted to unsigned long geeks and we will get this monstrosity. Not minus one. <laughs> okay. Mixing integral types may cause horrible, horrible bugs. And we always have to be careful about those things. So here we have a stupid program that's called count that receives size. And it has an uin64 type count. Then it just force until size minus i equals or greater than zero. So it sh should be, to stop, it needs to be less than zero. What will happen here? Infinite loop. Infinite loop, that's right. <laughs> Here's a more uh, concrete example so of things that might happen to you if you mix those types together. So if you will lose, use a byte, a buffer of bytes, and we will provide a size, and as I mentioned before, most programmers always want to write int and not something else. So someone here actually wrote int size. And then it used, he or she used inside the, the function itself, decided to use unsigned because we are saying, okay, we don't need signness here because it's an index to an array. Let's be smart here, right? But they're using sign. And they're actually checking if i is less than size, things will get promoted here. And we will have, what we will have here? Buffer overflow. Another thing that I started to sing in a lot of code bases is this pattern. I love auto. I think auto should be used a lot, but don't abuse it. If you don't understand exactly what you are doing, you should use concrete types. So here, without noticing, we are mixing two types together. We have unsigned int size, and the auto i, what will it be deduced to be? An integer. Yes? Wouldn't the decal type be the correct uh, choice here? Decal type of, of size? No, if, it's, it, if it will be decal type of zero, it will be the same result. Yeah. 
But if you will do decal type of size, that's correct. But, but because here it's not a generic function, you can just write in 32, that's it. So no need for that. If you can use concrete types, it's better to use concrete type. And I'm saying it from being a metaprogramming engineer and I'm writing a lot of generic programs and I love auto, but don't abuse it. So we have many, many literal types that we need to understand how they work. And if we write something, we need to understand what we're writing. If you are using literals, and we should use literals because they're constant and it helps us, we need to know that we have a couple of those. So here I'm representing A1 to A6. Each one of those represents different literals that we have. The first one will be deduced to be int. The second one will be deduced to be unsigned int. The third one, long. The, the fourth one, unsigned long. The fifth one, long long and unsigned long long. If you really wish to use auto with a literal, you need to understand which literal you want to use. That's really, really important. I'm seeing it in uh, my company's code base and I'm going to those people and I'm speaking with them because they're causing bugs. There are special types in the system as well. Uh, who knows about size t? What does size t do and why it was invented? Well, I wrote it here, so <laughs> that's a stupid question from my side. So size t is just unsigned, but it's an actual, si uh, it's an actual type that was, invent, uh, that was defined in C89, something really old, to fix a portability problem. Who knows about the portability problem it, wants, uh, it uh, has to fix? You know everything, why are you here? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so the portability problem was that sometimes unsigned long wasn't big enough to represent all the memory space and sometimes unsigned long long was too large to represent it. So they invented something that represents both of those things to get portability from one system to another. And there's a new type that was de uh, defined in POS 6, 1, 2017, a and signed size t. This is something new that not many things define yet. And it's basically saying, okay, we, we still can use it for size of something, but it can represent a signed number. So it can be minus one. Whoever used, for example, uh, vectors and, it, uh, and they wanted to see the size of the vector, and sometimes they wish they had minus one there. No one? Okay. It's an error. Thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> So many, many people are, sp are actually inside the standard that are talking about this, that all size functions should have been signed and not unsigned. And there are actually signed functions being added as size, so signed size, because sometimes you need to actually use it. And in C++23, uh, size, S size T is actually defined and you can use it. And you actually have both literals for size t and unsigned size t in the C23. So basically, if we are using z and uz, we're saying s size t and size t itself. So in, on my system, it's long and unsigned long. Okay, pop quiz. What will happen in this program? Anyone? Yes. Well, the 64 is going to get promoted to an unsigned int 64. We know that already. Right. Yeah, but uh, that's not the problem here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just repeating what you said. Uh, so someone from the audience is saying that uh, 64 will be promoted to u in 64. Yes. Also the one. Also, no. Yeah. It will be promoted afterwards. But, what's the size of one? Yes, and an integer is of size, size of? Depends on the system. Right, on some system it's 32 bits, right? So someone wanted to do something really smart here, but uh, if his system is 32 bits, and the integer is 32 bits, on x86 when you write int, it's 32 bits, 
and the count is larger than 32, uh, than 32 bits, you will get an overflow. Now that we understand all the pitfalls, all the things that might happen with sinus and unsinus, and there are many more, believe me, there are many more things that can, may, and will happen to you when you use it. We will go to a more complex program that will represent an arithmetic series. So an arithmetic series is a series of numbers that between each number, there is a constant difference. For example, 1 to ten, uh, two n is an arithmetic series with a difference of 1 between each number. For an arithmetic series, you have a, a nice equation that can tell you what's the sum of all the series. So basically it's saying if from k equals 1 to n, we will sum everything up and it will be equal to n, a1 and a n, which a1 is the first number of the series. A n is the last number of the series divided by two. Pretty simple. Those are the signed and unsigned programs that represent the arithmetic series for from one to n. Which one do you think will act faster here? Which one will be better? Which one will have more performance for us? It's optimized with O2. Sign on or sign? Uh, Only two? Probably the unsign. OK, let's see. So let's look at the unsign, unsign assembly. That's not that bad, but what's going on here? So we have test. Test is just something to, to set the specified flags in the, com uh, in the processor that say that something is equal to 0 or not. So basically what it's doing here, it's saying, OK, let's test if the register that uh, received the parameter is 0. If it's 0, we will jump to LBB71. LBB71 is just sorting EAX and EAX. And that's a fancy way to zero something out. And if it's a 0 and EAX, then we are returning it. But if it's not 0, if our parameter is not 0, we are setting ECX to 1. We are storing EEX in EEX, as we said, is a fancy, fancy way to do a zeroing for something. Then we are jumping to LBB74, which is a loop. And inside the loop, we are saying RAX is equal RAX plus RCX. We are then adding RCX plus 1. That's the loop that increases the i. Then we are comparing R6 to RDI. That means that we are doing something that's comparing if we can finish the loop or not. And if it's, if it's below or equals to, then it jumps back to the same uh, label. So it's a loop. We have a loop here. And as you know, loops are not that performant. Now let's look at the sign assembly for the same program. If you would look at the sign assembly, you can see that no loops here. The only thing that you have here is the same test, the test if the RDI is zero, and if it's zero, we can return zero and that's it. But then we will not go into this code because it's a little bit more complex for this uh, conversation or this talk, but it's just using the equation. So with signed numbers, the compiler was smart enough to understand that it can use an shortcut, an equation, to do something. And if you would look at the performance of those things, the signed version is 40 times faster than the unsigned version. 40 times. That's not a joke. And the, both of those versions were optimized with O2 on the same compiler, GCC 13, O0, O1. And why do you think we have such a significant change between those two versions. Oops. Sorry? You mean why the result or why? Why, why, why the result is so different? The, why in, when you're using sign integers, you can deduce that you can use something, but you cannot deduce it with unsigned integers. Okay. They're the same, right? Both cases, 
unsigned we have to get fine behavior we have to calculate correctly with the unsigned version it's undefined behavior the compiler is not uh, doesn't need to calculate to so thank you Tomer so Tomer said that uh, it's an undefined behavior and yes as I mentioned it's an undefined behavior because <laughs> it's undefined behavior because when you're using sign ints overflow is undefined and when you have something that is undefined behavior we're saying the compiler is saying we are not saying that the compiler is saying oh well it's undefined so I can do whatever I want fun for us so when it, 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 it can do whatever it wants, it can overflow, it can do something. It may, might work for most cases, but in some cases it will just explode and do something else that you didn't expect. But hey, you have performance, right? That's what we wanted. <laughs> so the choice between performance and well-defined programs, it's very important. And we have to understand, again, when we're using the unsigned, uh, the integral types, we always have to think about those things. Because sometimes you will have performance like here, and you will say, hey, I did something great, I chose the correct type. But no, you haven't. You just get, gave the compiler the opportunity to optimize something to a point of over-optimizing it for you. So what can we do? The first thing we can do and should do is use newer compilers they optimize things better. As I mentioned, I compiled it with 1301. Uh, and at 14, unsigned ins and signed ins do the same thing. Surprise. They did something inside the compiler, and now they see better into the equations themselves. What is the thing they do? I haven't gone to that, so I don't have an answer. But we can uh, look at it later. Uh, use sanitizers. So we have sanitizers all the time, and uh, those sanitizers are your friends. So you can use f sanitize sign integer overflow. If you will use this flag, the compiler cannot overflow. It's not undefined behavior anymore. It has to check for overflows. And if you will use this, the assembly for unsigned, so sorry, the assembly for signed will be. 40 times as bad as for the unsigned. And unsigned will be 40 times as fast, faster than the signed version. That's another problem. You have to understand all those things and work with those things to understand that your program works correctly. And I guess not many people understand and know those, uh, about those flags. Who knew about these flags before? Great. <laughs> Who uses them? Wow. One person. OK. Uh, another thing that we can do and we should do is use special types for better performance. There are some special types that are defined as int fast n and unsigned int fast n. Who heard about those before? Nice. One person in the room. So those things are, you are saying basically, what you're saying here is, I want an signed integer or unsigned integer with a minimal number of bits of n. Please select the best one for me. And if you will use it, it's almost guaranteed that the compiler will select the better one for you, for your needs. Know your CPU, as we said, there are latency. There are things that we need to understand and to work on. So when you use something, you have to understand how to use it and what will happen inside your CPU. There are special he uh, helpers that were introduced in C++11. And those helpers, helpers are make sign and unsign. Those are really important in generic programming. When you're using something and you're not sure what you're getting, but you want to work with a very special type that is signed or unsigned, you should use those things. They're helping you. And for example, there's a way to use them. So you have a make signed version of something that receives an auto of value and returns a make signed T 
decal type of while. We are saying basically, please give me the type of the value that I received in and create a signed version of this value and please initialize it with the value itself. So this function basically returns, if we will use it with make signed ver with a u in 64t, it will return const int 64 bit. So that's pretty nice. And it was introduced in C++11, so almost everyone who here should have access to those things. Another very, very important thing and very useful thing that was added in C++20 is safe comparisons. Uh, if you are using older programs or you are not sure if you will get a signed and unsigned version, and as we know, mixing those things will make your life a living hell with bugs that you will have to find by yourself. It's hard to find those bugs. Use those. Each one of those are called safe comparison for sign and unsigned. So it doesn't care if it received two signs, two unsigned, one signed and one unsigned. It will compare it for you the way you want it to be compared. And you will have less surprises in your code. Yes? Sorry again? Usually the, most of the things are optimized out because those functions are small, but you have to do some branching inside them. And uh, the STL does it for you. So you have to understand which kind of type you have there and create the type. For example, inside those functions you use make sign or make unsigned. Almost no cost. The overhead is very small. But again, you, you will have some overhead because there are no, uh, no obstruction without a cost. We, know, we all know that. Almost no obstruction without a cost. So what do you prefer? Well-defined program or performance? Again, I'm asking the same question. And the compiler will do the job for you. It will not uh, leave you in the dark. Yeah, but you might be able to do some branching with compiler. Do you they are const expert. They are const expert, and you will get the performance you need from the compiler. But you have to understand if it cannot be const expert, and it might have worse performance because it still needs to branch inside it, and it still creates, a, it calls different functions. But it calls make sign and make unsign, which are also const. So it should be very small hump in your performance, but the program will be well defined. So it's a win and lose, like always. Avoid using auto when not sure about the type itself. This is the cause of many betting bugs. When you're not sure and you can use a, uh, a defined type, well-defined type, please use a well-defined type. And again, I'm saying it from a place where I use autos a lot and I love autos, but don't abuse those things. Use concrete types when possible. Use more the modern loops as much as you can. Don't use, uh, don't use index-based loops. Uh, iterators for each, each one of those things will help you with optimizing and it will help you to do things better and safer than when you are trying to use an index and if you are using sign or unsign and then you will try to access some place inside the memory which are, is not accessible, then you will have a lot of problems there. So please be careful with those things. And last and most important thing, Use strong types. If you are creating your own type and you want to use something, don't just alias it. Don't say using strong int equals int because it's just aliasing. You're just saying, okay, it's strong int. But you can receive int, unsigned int, everything else. Create your own type. Give it a name. Create an explicit constructor for it, for it to be very, very strong, and then you will avoid many, many bugs and problems in your code. Questions? Just, just a comment. Yes. Uh, narrowing issues and uh, sign meets 
patches are usually caught or should be caught by the compiler uh, as warnings and hopefully as errors. So, you know, this is up to your configuration, but yeah, maybe it's worth mentioning that. Okay, so what Iran just said is uh, most of the narrowing and changing the types can be caught by your compiler, but not by default. The default behavior of the compilers are not to warn you about those uh, implicit conversions. And that's the big problem C++. I think those things should be caught. I think those things shouldn't be errors because maybe you want them, but they shouldn't be, uh, they should be warnings. They should be seen as a default uh, behavior, not as something that most people don't know how to even turn on. Who knows the warning for a sign and sign conversion? Five people out of everyone here, so you understand the problem that I'm uh, trying to, uh, to, to explain. Always try to do something that is better and well-defined than to say, okay, someone will know about a flag that should help me, because that will not happen. No, it's an indication of uh, unused uh, ability of the tool. I mean, if you're not getting these kind of warnings, then you're not using the compiler um, on its ability. That's true, but again, C++ says all C++ compilers tell you no, you don't need that. Right. If you want it, please ask for it. Because like everything in C++ is, if you want something, you have to know how to do it. So here is the same thing. If you want something, know how to do it. I prefer that people would understand the problems with mixing those things and avoid those things than someone from DevOps team or someone else is uh, building the build system and will say, okay, I forgot a flag or something. And no one else knows about the flag if it's not Iran or Alex here or someone else that do know about the flag. Well, if you, if you use the uh, WALS or, the, or more, or this, uh, you get it uh, for free. No. Uh, when you use WALS, you still, some compilers are hiding it. And you still need to provide an actual flag for sign and sign operations. So it depends on your compiler. And again, it's a pitfall. Yes? So uh, that type of automatica uh, operation? <laughs> if it wasn't uh, explained during, uh, sorry, so I was asked uh, what's the best type to use for mathematical uh, equations? I will be stoned for this, but I would say unsigned. Why unsign? Because it's easier to define, to understand that something wraps around or something is overflowing in unsigned. If you're using the CPU and using the correct flags, it's easier to work with those types. Should you always use unsigned? No. You always should use the type that you need for the job. So that's the most important thing from this talk. You need to understand the types. You need to understand what each type means and how to use them to your advantage. But never use undefined behavior as a performance enhancement thing, because your program will break eventually. So Andre asked me if uh, you are sure that your program will always use the right comparisons and you will be always in the right range of numbers. Should you then exploit undefined behavior for performance? It's not up to me to tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to exploit undefined behavior for your performance, do it. <laughs> but beware, it will break sometime. Maybe now you are using it for the correct range. Tomorrow someone new will come and you will say, okay, let's use it for a different range. And then you will break. Anyone else? Yes, Aram. Uh, in one of your examples you showed, you were adding two, uh, two bytes. Mm -hmm. to either you int eight or int eight. Yes. And the compiler promoted it to two ints. Even though you said there are registers that are uh, four 8-bit registers. So why would the compiler pro, uh, promote them, do you know? 
why it promotes into 64 bits? If there are, yeah, if there are registers. For no, you mean why it promotes it for 32 bits? Yes. Because it's defined in the standard. So those things are just implicitly, it's, it's defined in the C standard, this implicit conversion. Okay. So if something is smaller, it's easier for the CPU to work on something that is 32 bits or higher. Okay. So the minimal quanta for that work is 32 bits. And uh, the compiler just uh, does the work for you. So int can be 32 bits, can be 64 bits. It's easier for the uh, processor to work on those things. And that's why it just upgrades them to something that is the smaller quanta, the smallest thing that the CPU will be, uh, will, it will be easier for the CPU to work on. Okay. 